I'm in Banksy Woodland in the north of Perth, in a suburb called Balladura. And this is favourite feeding ground of the endangered Carnaby's cockatoo. I'm here with researcher yep. Dr Christine Groom from the University of Western Australia, who's been studying the Carnabies very closely. Carnaby's cockatoo is an endangered species. It's only found in southwest of Western Australia um, and it visits the, the Swan Coast Plain or, or the city of Perth uh, during the non-breeding season. They're a clever bird. They've got an amazing um, spatial and temporal knowledge, so they'll return to the same food sources year after year at the right time for those food resources to be at the right stage for them to eat. They pair for life, and so both parents help raise the chick. They use a nest hollow, so a hollow in a tree. And why are they endangered as a species? The main threat is habitat loss. So on the Swan Coastal Plain, Banksy Woodland is a main food source for them. And of course, a lot of that's been cleared for housing and development. Um, where they breed in the inland areas is the wheat belt. And of course, that's been cleared for, for cropping mostly. And tell us a bit about your research and what you were trying to better understand. Um, so my project was looking at the urban landscape. And the main objective was figuring out how carnabies actually survive in the urban landscape so that we can better accommodate their needs into the future. My main method was to attach satellite tracking devices to their tail feathers, um, and then I had to follow them um, and take field observations of what they were feeding on, where they were roosting, where they were drinking, all those kind of things. What types of species do carnabies naturally feed on? They mostly feed on proteaceous species, so that's your banksias and hakeas. So um, bushland like this is really important to them. And any species in particular? Uh, Banksia menziesii, Banksia attenuata are two okay, particular. Uh, favourites? Yeah. And so I guess it's absolutely critical that whatever remnant vegetation, particularly of the Banksia woodland, is left, that that's kept and protected. Absolutely, it's really, really important. Um, and Banksia woodland is actually listed as a threatened ecological community as well. Josh, this is a really good example of um, Banksia attenuata or the candlestick Banksia. So the, the carnabies use these for um, feeding on the nectar. You can see up there the, the cone there, they feed on the seeds out of that. And they also rip into the, the cones and all the, the branches for, to feed on grubs as well. And occasionally you'll see them feeding on the leaves. Okay, so really it's a year-round food source for sugars and protein and probably carbohydrates too. That's right. So the banksias provide food throughout the year. Okay, which is why they're so critical for them. That's right, yep. Of course, carnabies need more than food, and Christine's research led her here, a local park which is also providing important habitat. So through tracking my study birds, I showed that they used um, Banksia woodland like we've just been in, um, but they also um, need to drink. So this here is a, a lake they used, um, and they like to fly into an area and perch in the trees around, check out that it's safe to, to land and, and get down on the ground, because they're a big bird, they take a while to take off, so they need to make sure it's safe. Um, they also need the sloping bank so they can waddle down to actually take their drink and have a bath if they want to. Also what we've got here, it's a big smooth bark eucalypts, which they like to roost in. So this is actually where they spend the night. They roost communally at night time. So that's interesting. That They're exotic species, i.e. they're not from Perth. They're typically Eastern State eucs. That's right, uh, yeah. And there are several different species here. But they prefer those over local large eucalypts. That's what I found, actually, yeah. So exotic smooth bark eucalypts. So um, eucalyptus grandis, eucalyptus citriodora, so the lemon-scented gum. Yeah. They love those. They also use pine trees as well. Down the path, there's actually a, a recreation oval which has got some um, exotic, tall, smooth bark eucalypts that the cockatoos love to roost in. Um, so over 300 birds are recorded roosting there, so it's an important roosting site. And they like those particular trees because they've been planted in clumps all around the oval, so they, um, they provide really good roosting habitat for the birds. So you've obviously got a really good idea how these birds are moving around. How do you track them? I actually put um, Argos satellite tracking devices on their, their tail feathers. So this is an example of one of those. So this unit here, it weighs about 17 grams and you can see the aerials attached along the, the shaft of the tail feather there. Okay, now I'm assuming you have to 
not only catch the bird, but put them asleep as well to fix those? Yeah, so we fitted these under anaesthetic. Um, so all my study birds were actually from rehabilitation centres. So they're birds that were originally in the wild, but they've been hit by cars or, or had other calamities happen to them so that we could catch them up in the aviaries. And once they were ready to be released, we put the tracking devices and on And did them. they readily yeah. join the rest of the natural population once released? They did, they did, yeah. Some of them took a bit longer than others, but none of them returned to the rehab centres and they all foraged fine and, yeah, they, they did very well. And so how many birds were you monitoring? I had 23 birds um, split between two years and marked their tail feathers with a colour, coloured ink, so um, blue or pink and a, a letter. That meant that when I was in the field observing the birds, what they were feeding on and all that, I could actually identify individual birds too. Can they eventually drop out naturally, do they, when those feathers give way? They do, yeah. So I didn't expect to be able to recapture my birds. So from an animal ethics point of view, I needed a way of attaching it to the birds that it wasn't going to be a permanent burden to the birds. So they molt their feathers every one or two years, and so um, this was going to come off the bird naturally. I understand that the tracking of the birds took you to this street, which looks like a pretty typical street. What's so special about it? Yeah, they did. Um, I was at the mercy of my birds is where they, they took me. I followed them wherever they went and one of the streets they came to is here. Um, something they were feeding on is these tipuanas. So this is an exotic species that's quite often used as, as street trees and they provide really good shade for parklands and in your own front yard or backyard. But cockatoo forage as well. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Further down the street, there's also some um, Rottnest Island pine that they were getting stuck into. And the big one, there's a really huge pecan tree and macadamia tree that they absolutely love. Well, that's not so surprising. <laughs> no. <laughs> From your research, what are some of the practical take-home things that gardeners can do to help the carnivores cockatoo? Well, this is where I think um, my research is actually quite inspiring because it actually means that the home gardener can actually help this endangered species. So the main things are to provide food. Um, so planting things they can eat, like the, the banksias, the hakeas, nut trees, um, grevilleas, all sorts of things like that. There's a whole suite of things that the home gardener can plant. Um, providing water, put in a bird bath, um, and uh, looking after local bushland, so joining your local friends of group, things like that. And making sure we protect the remnant vegetation that's still there. That's right, yep. We mustn't underestimate the important role that our gardens, streetscapes, and parks can play when it comes to contributing to urban habitat. And as we've seen with the case of the Carnaby's cockatoo, it can literally mean the difference between extinction and survival.